relations come. Nation come, all my relations under the sun. We are one. We are praying. Come, we are praying. Come, we are the song and we are the drum. We are one. We are the river come, we are the river come, we are the boat, the paddle, the shore, we are one. Many with tronies we are the water sing we are the water sing we are the water we are We are the ancient ones, we are the ancient ones, in your breath and bones we sing on, we are one, we are the meadow come, we are the meadow come, we are the lark that sings a new day, has begun. We are the new day, run, run, run. We are the new day, run, run, run. We are the old and we are the young. We are one. Many which only see. Many which only see. Welcome everyone. Uh, thank you for joining this webinar uh, today, uh, The Voices from the West, uh, an interfaith conversation. Um, that was the Alouette sisters and you'll hear more from them later on. Um, but my name is Elise and uh, Elise Brazel and I'm the network coordinator with Faith in the Common Good. And I will be your host this evening. Um, so this is a part of the Climate Narratives Project, which is, an in, is a national interfaith webinar series that we've been doing over the last year, um, asking um, people from different faith traditions uh, how their faith inspires them to do environmental work um, and to share those stories. And so Voices from the West is a fourth, the fourth of our webinar series, and it was generously funded by the Clean Economy Fund. And if you are interested in watching any of our other webinars um, on taking action on climate change, uh, sacred water, or youth-led climate action, you can find them on uh, the Faith in the Common Good YouTube channel. So um, 
This is Beatrice. Um, before we begin, I'm going to introduce her as she is my uh, comrade tonight. Um, just to let you know, uh, Michelle, uh, who is our ED, um, she is, uh, her power is out. <laughs> and so we are one human mm -hmm. now. And so we're going to try our best to make this happen. Um, but I know that you will, uh, you'll, 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 your prayers will be with us is how I'm thinking about it. <laughs> Um, and so uh, Beatrice, uh, she'll be monitoring the chats this evening. And so if you have any questions during the webinar, um, please put them into the chat window. And um, we have a Q&A section um, near the end where we can have conversations and go deeper into um, the session or what the speakers speak about tonight. And so mm -hmm. um, this webinar is going yeah, to- so Yeah, so- Michelle? Oh, sorry, I was to interrupt. I, no, I was gonna say, we may have to keep our questions to the end because it'd be difficult to monitor when we're doing the slides. But yeah. Okay. So um, keep your, yes, there will be a chance for you to ask questions. So think about your questions and think about what you want to ask. Um, but it might be later. So mm -hmm. um, yes, this web webinar is being recorded. It will be on our YouTube channel when it becomes available. We are going to share it with you. And uh, there'll also be um, a list of resources from um, the guest speakers tonight, uh, which will also be shared with you later. Um, Beatrice, uh, are you, you wanna share your screen? Sure, no. okay. Right, only one concern about, will you be able to see if people are coming into the room and you'll be able to? Yeah. You let them in. Okay, great. Perfect. All right, let's do this. So we're going to go here and uh, <laughs> making it work, y'all. Making it work. Yeah. So it's good. All right. Right. So this event is also a part of the Face for Climate Justice um, Green Faith International's movement that's currently going on between October 2nd and November 6th. Um, and so it's a, a global multi-faith action movement um, of events that are going on around the world. So if you want to learn more and find out other events that you can go to, uh, check out their website. So um, next slide, please. All right, so as I said, big thank you to the Alouette sisters for opening us up in song. Um, and we are gathered here to be a part of a conversation about and hear from uh, people in Western Canada from diverse faith backgrounds to talk about how they uh, protect their environment and also how their faith inspires them to find solutions. Um, and so we have five speakers tonight. We've got the Alouette sisters, um, Janet, uh, sorry, Jeanette, Ruth, and Catherine. And we also have uh, Dave, who uh, is coming from Calgary, and we have um, Abhe, who's coming in from Toronto, but is originally from Surrey. And so um, bef we, before we wrap up today, we'll also be sharing some resources um, that you can use at home or in your place of worship, or it's just somewhere within your community. And so they're intended for everyone. They've got small actions, big actions, but mostly important, most importantly, um, what we hope that people get out of today's conversation is a deeper connection to the land that surrounds each of us, wherever you are coming from today. And so um, with that, I would love for um, Beatrice to uh, open us up with the land acknowledgement. Oh, wow. Okay. Let me so that do is that. Um, okay. Sorry. <laughs> so we are a collaboration of organizations from coast to coast to coast on the traditional ceded and unceded territories of diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis peoples. These nations live in a deep reciprocal relationship with not only the land and the waterways, but also with the physical and spiritual forces that connect them to their place of creation in an intimate and meaningful way. We are grateful to have the opportunity to live, work, and thrive together. We are also mindful of broken covenants and the need to work towards reconciliation on many levels. To learn more about whose territory, whose traditional territory you are on, please visit the uh, www.nativeland.ca. Thanks so much. All right, next slide. Um, so Michelle was supposed to be doing the intro, but I'm going to do it. I'm going to wing it. Um, so faith in the common good. Uh, for those of you who don't know, um, we are a national organization, uh, a collection of interfaith um, uh, network 
um, across the country that's been doing this work for the last 21 years. Um, and we're dedicated to getting people from different religious uh, congregations um, and spiritual groups to take action on uh, creating more resilient and compassionate um, and sustainable communities that they live in. Um, and that looks like many things in many forms. And one of the things is this climate narratives project. Um, we'll tell you more about other, other things that we're up to, but um, for now, we'll move into that ever important part of, of, of this webinar, which is the listening, learning and acting. So next slide, please. If you want to learn more about faith in the common good, uh, the Beatrice will put the link in the website. Um, and so, yeah. so today's conversation is an invitation um, and a call to action and an opportunity to collectively come together and listen to our guests um, and think about um, what it means to live in a just sustainable future. Uh, learn from them in, in the context they're coming from. Um, we've invited five amazing speakers from different um, faiths and different communities um, to share what inspires them to take care of our common home. And uh, we also uh, use this as an opportunity to place climate activists who are in the West at the center of this conversation because their context and experiences are very different, uh, complex and rich. And so in this conversa conversation, we aim to educate and inspire um, people to take action in their own communities and to advocate for faith leadership in the way of climate action. And so next slide. Um, oh, next slide for me, not for you. Um, so <laughs> we've asked uh, each of our speakers to share a little bit about uh, what it is in their faith tradition that in inspires them to care for our common home? Um, and also, what does that look like? What does action look like in their community? Um, and so uh, we'll start with our, our speakers. And so first up is going to be uh, Abhay. So uh, we'll spotlight Abhay and, and do the next slide. All right, there he is. Right. Abhay's smiling face right there, it's great. All right, so Abhay Singh uh, Sachal is a 20-year-old Canadian human humanitarian whose work resides in the intersections of climate change, eco-anxiety, mental health, and spirituality. He is the founder of Break the Divide, which is a nonprofit organization based on the principles of environmentalism, sustainability, and reconciliation that focuses on fostering empathy and understanding to inspire action projects and communities. He seeks to build ways in which young people can connect and learn from one another in an increasingly polarized world, allowing them to build empathy for realities that they have never faced and empowering them to transform that empathy into concrete actions that advance the creation of harmonious and abundant futures. From apathy to empathy to action. As a result of his work, he has been recognized as one of Canada's top 25 under 25 environmentalists. Um, he's been featured as one of the 10 international young change makers in Canada and listed as amongst the 100 most influential sick from around the world. And outside of his activism, uh, he also is a student at the University of Toronto studying global health and peace and conflict studies. He's a public speaker on environment and climate issues and an avid ice hockey player as well as a pianist. So uh, we'll pass it on to Ab. Hey, thanks so much. Yeah, uh, thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here speaking to everyone today. Um, I don't have any slides for this, so it's totally cool if we don't have the slides up. I'm just hoping to have a candid conversation with everyone. And if you do have any questions at all at any point during this conversation, uh, feel free to pop them in the chat and I can definitely get to them now. I can get to them later on too. Uh, but don't forget your questions, make sure you write them down. Uh, it is such a pleasure to be here today. My name is Abe Singh Sachal. I am a student at the University of Toronto. I'm from Surrey, BC. Uh, Surrey is my home, but I'm in Toronto now. And in, in Surrey, I'm from the unceded traditional territory of the Tawasin, Musqueam, and Swellentooth First Peoples, uh, who have been stewards of the land since time immemorial. I think uh, it, it's so important to acknowledge the land that we're from, not solely just for the sake of doing so, but to recognize what benefits we reap from the land, recognizing how uh, that land has caused us to exist in the way that we do today, and understand whose expense that benefit has come at. And so in thinking about the land that we come, on, we come from, 
Uh, the land is such an intricate part, uh, and it's an integral part of our uh, conversation about climate change, issues like mental health, issues like building a just and resilient world. And so I'd like everyone to just pause for a moment and, and really think about what land you come from. How have you benefited from that land? Whose expense did that benefit come at? And what can you do in this present moment now to use your privilege and um, whatever benefit that you do reap from that land in your obligation to serve the people of the land and the land itself? That's one thing that I really love um, starting off with, because I think when we think of land and when we think of decolonization, for example, these can come off as very abstract concepts, but there are very practical things that we can do. And I'd love to have this dialogue where we can have a really candid conversation about all these sorts of things. Uh, so my name is Abe, uh, and I'm from Surrey, BC, and that's a big part of my story. Uh, I also run a nonprofit called Break the Divide, which I'll tell everyone a lot about, uh, and I'm a practicing Sikh. Uh, and so I know in Western Canada, there's a large Sikh population. Uh, I'm very excited to be able to talk a bit about what Sikhi, uh, Sikhism or Sikhi as it's commonly called, is really about and how some main principles of Sikhi have informed my views on climate change, how they inform my action and what you can take from that. And so I guess I'll start with my story when it comes to climate action and uh, the ways that it's connected to how I take climate action today. Uh, I grew up in BC, and as many people from Western Canada know, BC is absolutely beautiful. I grew up with the water on one side, the mountains on the other, and forests in the middle. Uh, and I remember just from a young age, <laughs> having experiences being with nature, uh, going out to forests and parks and walking out, uh, experiencing nature around me, but also recognizing that people are such a big part of nature. For me, nature was going to play hockey um, and recognizing that people around me were a part of that environment that was so important to me. And, and so thinking of nature growing up really in, ingrained with me um, a consciousness and an understanding that climate action is here today, uh, climate change is here today, and it's so necessary that we take climate action. And, and so I think growing up in BC, I already had a bit of that sort of climate spark in me. Uh, and when I was 14 years old, uh, in 2016, I had this amazing opportunity to travel to the Canadian Arctic. Uh, and so I was in Nunavut uh, and I was in uh, Greenland and it was absolutely incredible. I was on an expedition with 200 people from around the world through the Students on Ice Foundation. This is a Canadian organization that takes 100 students from around the world to the Arctic and Antarctic on alternating years. I was really fortunate to get a scholarship to go up to the Arctic and I was with 100 students from around the world, but also 100 educators. So these were scientists, historians, musicians, people from all sorts of walks of life. And it was so incredible just to learn from them. And going to the Arctic, one of the things that really happened was I was able to see the impacts of climate change firsthand. And when I say that, you know, you might think of icebergs, you might think of polar bears. There was this one moment at the Ilulisat iceberg in Greenland. So this is a place where ice is stretched out for kilometers and kilometers, as far as your eye can see. And all 200 people that were on this expedition at this time, all 200 of us went silent for a moment. And when we all went silent, we could literally hear the icebergs melting. It was millions of drops of the purest water on the planet going into the freshest body of water that exists. And I remember at 14 years old, experiencing that, feeling that, and feeling like the weight of the world was on my shoulders, like I had to take climate action right now or we, or we wouldn't be okay. And I remember feeling very overwhelmed. I remember feeling pretty anxious about the future. And these are emotions that are not uncommon for most young people today. You know, a recent survey of 10,000 youth around the world showed that over 60% of youth are experiencing anxiety because of climate change. Large numbers of youth do not want to have children as a result of the climate crisis. And so as we think of climate change and what it means for mental health, we cannot disconnect the reality of the world that we're living with, with the psyche that we have. And so understanding how climate change is related to mental health was a big start for me when I was in the Arctic, recognizing that, oh, the world does have impacts on my own emotions. And, and recognizing that was huge for me. And so as we think of climate change and climate action, I, I remember feeling very overwhelmed in being in the Arctic uh, and wanting to do something about it. So, one thing that the Arctic really showed me as well was the immense resilience and wisdom of 
my peers. Of the 100 youth that were on this Arctic expedition, 50 were Inuit students. So the Inuit are indigenous to the Arctic. Uh, they've lived in the Arctic for tens of thousands of years. And uh, learning from my Inuit friends, I understood that climate change is not a new phenomenon in, in the Arctic. Climate change has been impacting the Arctic for the past 20, 30 years. And the Inuit had been forced to adapt, not just to the impacts of climate change, but to the impacts of colonialism. So learning about land relocation because of colonialism, and then seeing the parallels between that and relocation because of rising sea levels was very insightful for me. And it, it was understanding how climate change is linked to so many different issues. Was, it, was a, it was a game changer for me. And so I remember being very inspired by the resilience of my Inuit peers, recognizing that their resilience stemmed from multiple factors of cultural resilience, spiritual resilience, which I'm sure we can talk more about. Um, and so coming back from the Arctic, I was, again, very inspired and I, I was very excited to do something. I really felt like I wanted to do something. And so I talked to my peers. I talked to people around me about the Arctic. I talked about climate change. I talked about how sea ice is melting, how polar bears are migrating south, how real people are affected by this. But one thing that I realized as I began to have these conversations was that there was a bit of a disconnect. There's a bit of a disconnect between what I was saying and what people were hearing. And, and while people understood that climate change was real and was here today, people didn't really feel super connected to it. And it still felt like an issue that was far away, despite it happening within Canada itself. And so one thing that I realized was sort of the issue there was that as young people, we have been in this era of social media, we've been in this era of information, and we felt a lot of apathy about communities that we aren't actually connected to. And so we started a very simple project called Break the Divide. And the idea was simple. It was that if we get students in the Arctic talking to students in BC, just through video calls, uh, we could foster empathy and we could learn about each other. And that could potentially drive action. It could break down the divisions between our communities. And so we started a dialogue between uh, a school in Inuvik and the Northwest Territories and my high school in Delta, BC. Uh, and it was just incredible seeing students learn so much about one another. We talked about um, Canada's dark history with residential schools. We talked about intergenerational trauma. We talked about the local impacts of climate change. I remember uh, students in the Arctic and in, in, in Inuvik talking to us about how because sea ice is melting and because patterns are no longer predictable, elders that are going out to hunt for seal are no longer able to rely on such predictable weather patterns. And that was, again, a big thing for us, realizing that, okay, there was a real impact of climate change today. And likewise, we made sure that the conversation was reciprocal in nature. We talked about many of our struggles in our communities. We talked about, you know, being in Surrey, BC and dealing with the issues of gang violence, of drugs, um, of integration, of racism. And those conversations were so powerful. And in doing so, we recognized that we were breaking the divide between our communities. And so um, with my team, I expanded Break the Divide to schools around the world. Now we're in chapters around the world and we talk about issues like climate change, about mental health. And our fundamental approach of going from a state of apathy or disconnectedness to empathy and driving that empathy and turning it into action has been replicated in schools around the world. And it's been incredibly powerful to see young people learn from one another through conversation and use that conversation to drive action. One thing that I think is so critical about conversations like this today or the conversations that we have at Break the Divide is understanding that every community has a different way of looking at the world, whether it's a religious community, whether it's a geographic community, whether it's a community based on common oppression, common identity, common interest. You know, I belong to a community of hockey players in Canada. And growing up playing hockey in Canada, I recognized that there was so much power in teamwork and being out in the cold. And like, you know, there are things that have developed my understanding of being a part, part of the hockey community in Canada. And that's different from being a part of any other community. And so what we realized we were doing was getting people to talk about their different ways of knowing, the different knowledge paradigms that come from each community and learn from those respective knowledge systems. And so as I think of my own identity and uh, being a practicing Sikh and how that has impacted my own work, even as I think about issues of climate change and mental health that are prominent today, it's an area of research for myself and it's an area of major action within Break the Divide. Uh, growing up in the Sikh faith, growing up 
uh, with this identity of not cutting my hair, of wearing a turban every day. Uh, whenever I go in, out into the public, the purpose of the turban is to stand out so that when someone else sees me, they know that I am someone who is beholden to the tradition of justice, of equality, uh, and, and therefore I must help. That is the idea of the turban. And so it, it's something that I carry every single day. And as I think about Sikhi, I, I'll talk about three quick concepts uh, before I just close with a, uh, a statement about what this means for all of us. Uh, the three concepts that I want to talk about is the Sikh view on oneness, um, the Sikh principle of service or seva, and the idea of eternal optimism within Sikhi. Uh, so firstly, when we think of oneness within the Sikh faith, uh, Sikhi is a relatively recent uh, religion. It was founded in 1469, uh, and it was founded in Northern India, in Punjab. Uh, and now the first Sikh migrants to Canada came in the late 1800s, uh, and understanding that history of Sikhi in Canada is really important to understanding what the communities around us mean. The Sikh view on oneness is one of understanding that nature, people, and everything in between, we're all one and we're all connected. There is no other out there. And so God within the Sikh tradition is the oneness that exists within all of us. And so in trying to achieve that oneness, growing up, learning about this idea of connectedness with other people, it was a very spiritual sense of when I see someone else in pain or suffering, that is also my suffering. And it, it's not giving my own away. There is no self in that sense. It's helping others through helping yourself. And, and that relates to the second concept that I want to talk about, which is seva. Seva is commonly translated to selfless service. Uh, but I would argue that the idea of seva within Sikhi is a bit deeper than merely selfless service or charity. You know, if you think of any Sikh temple or Gurdwara in the world, especially across Western Canada, any Sikh temple that you go to, you will get a free meal. The idea is that in establishing that idea of ultimate equality between all people and this oneness, uh, no one should go hungry. And, and so going to any Gurdwara and getting a meal is a part of that. And seva is an idea of selfless service. But seva is actually a deeper idea as well that, 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 that concerns the, the ways in which we engage with the world ourselves. And what that means is to actually do meaningful work in the external world, you need to begin with work in the internal world. That means internal and intentional self-reflection about your place in the world, about your positionality, and about the ways that you can help others through helping yourself. And what that means is spiritual development, working with community, and understanding what that oneness means and how you can be a part of it. And the last concept that I want to touch on is this idea of eternal optimism, which within Sikhi is known as Chardi Gula. Uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do a test where I need everyone to repeat that back to me. <laughs> Chardikala, and I can write it in the chat as well. Chardikala is this idea of eternal optimism. It's this idea that even when you're within a fight, you must continue to battle and you cannot give up. That doesn't mean that you don't take a break. It means that the community around you must take care of one another. And in recognition of that oneness of everyone, Chardikala means that you must continue to fight and I often think of these three concepts, especially Charlie Gula, when we're thinking of the context of climate change. You know, we are in a state of climate, uh, planetary crisis, and we need everyone to come together. We need us to understand that we are fundamentally connected. And we also need to understand that service to others begins with ourselves. It begins with our homes, it begins with our communities, it begins within the places where we have influence. And, and so Charlie Gula, this idea of eternal optimism means that as we think of climate change, we're not too far gone. We can still take critical action on climate change today. And it is so important to do so because every degree of climate mitigation that we make happen is a life saved. It's a difference in someone else's life. It's worse impacts of storms. It's worse flooding in, uh, in PEI. It's worse flooding in BC. It's, you know, worse or better, I, I guess, you know, you better or worse hurricanes. I'm trying to figure out how to actually phrase that. Um, but it is a better future for each of us. And in understanding that we all collectively and individually have a role to play in that, Charlie Kala and these three sick principles uh, drive me. It drives the way that I do environmental work because it reminds me that I'm not just doing this for myself and I'm not just doing it for my kids or the future. I'm doing it for all those around me. 
And so being eternally optimistic in the context of climate change means that wherever you are in this work, you must continue to fight and create influence where you can, recognizing community and the immense power that communities can have. Ultimately, um, as I wrap up here, I, I think my story is really one of learning from community, having opportunities to learn from the people around me and understand that I'm not in this alone, that I'm connected to people. And there are structures for resilience, for building justice, that we can learn from other communities and, and take and adopt to our own. And so as we wrap up this discussion, I'm really looking forward to hearing from everyone else. And I'd love everyone to reflect and think about the areas where you hold influence. What are the communities that you're a part of? It doesn't have to be geographic. Uh, and uh, it doesn't just have to be faith-based or religious as well. It can also be the, uh, the community of people that you belong to, whether it's an interest-based community. If you like playing hockey, you have a community in hockey. If you like playing the piano like I do, you have a community in pianists in Canada. And so recognizing the different spheres where we hold influence is critical, recognizing how we can learn from the knowledge of other communities and understanding that climate action is a, is a necessity. We must continue to take climate action and we must challenge the systems that have gotten, gotten us to this point. You know, recognizing that it is important to tackle issues of power, of justice, of equity, as we're doing this work, because they're all systems that are connected. Uh, so I'm really excited for the rest of this discussion. Thank you for the time. And I'm looking forward to the Q&A later where we can have, I guess, a, a bigger discussion. Thank you, Abe. I feel like we just need to take a moment to like absorb all of it, you know? Make sure you put that word in the chat because that's gonna be one of my takeaways from today. Um, yeah, thank you so much. I feel like from what I, I'm like, I'm feeling inspired um, and hopeful. And I think that this is a really great segue into our next speaker um, who, who, who shares some of the, 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 that, that need for hope in the world. And so uh, we're gonna talk about, oh, there we go, Dave. Great, good job, Beatrice. Um, so Dave, uh, or David, uh, Saudi is a retired Lutheran pastor, um, certified, uh, and a cer certified Laudato Si animator, um, who currently lives in Calgary, um, but has served in parishes in Saskatchewan, Alberta, and Manitoba. Uh, he has retired, um, and you know, retirement is not something that, uh, <laughs> It keeps you busy. And so he is keeping busy um, as a catalyst for care for creation ministries in um, regional synods in Alberta and in Manitoba. Um, he's an avid fisherman and volunteers his time uh, at a conservation in, as a conservation interpreter at the Bow Habitat Station here in Calgary, uh, which is a fish hatchery and environmental center. And currently he's also exploring um, protecting our sacred water through interfaith cooperation, uh, taking worship outside of the walls of various spiritual traditions. And he's um, developing a six session series on that's interactive and relational. Uh, that's a webinar focusing on mental health and responding to the emotional impacts of climate change. And so uh, I'd love to pass it over to Dave, um, welcome. Thank you. I'm excited to hear from you. Good evening and uh, greetings to all of you. Um, Abe, I, I'm impressed with your youth, your energy, your opportunities, and, and the way that you have um, really addressed intersectionality, which is a fancy word for environmentalist work. Um, our backgrounds are so different. Um, you have a multicultural, um, urban, complex kind of thing. I grew up and uh, lived in Minnesota, where um, uh, rural ministry is about how uh, a, a local church, uh, a local Lutheran church, for instance, my, my background, uh, rural ministry is about how the Lutheran church gets along with the Pentecostals, the Catholics, and the other three Lutheran churches in the community. Um, very different from in Canada and very different from, from urban centers. I, I grew up with roots in the farm. My, my extended family were all farmers. Um, dad went off to engineering. I went off to, uh, to university as well. But I, I really appreciated 
that in, from my childhood, my folks gave me an appreciation for nature. Uh, we went camping, we went fishing, um, and, and that just became part of the core of, of who I am. So ministry in those days, we're talking ancient history now, um, 45 years ago, um, the focus of faith was on creating other Christians. The focus of, of faith was on individual um, faith, piety, uh, purity of life. Um, th the future uh, was all about, was wrapped up in, in one's decisions and, and the living of those decisions out in, ethically and compassionately. Um, I learned a lot in ministry that took me beyond all of that into a sense of, of uh, community, uh, a sense of uh, a global community and, and global justice. Um, so I have these childhood roots. I have a faith that was, that was focused on, um, on care of people, proper worship, proper theology, um, good thinking. Um, but where was the compassion for the broader world? When I when I retired and I, I had the best career um, I could ever ask for um, with lots of opportunities. But when I retired, I was, I was exposed to um, Pope Francis's Laudato Si and I was hungry for what I was reading. I, I went all over Winnipeg at the time asking, um, would somebody please open up this book to me so that I might understand? That's kind of a biblical story, a biblical quest, I think. But people weren't, weren't, weren't studying that. So I, I worked with my, with my synod, with my bishop, and, and we were going to explore faith and the care of creation and interview congregations and see what they were doing and, and what they might commit to. And it was all about local stuff, internal stuff, reduce, reuse, recycle stuff. There wasn't any sense of global justice, uh, food security, um, uh, issues around economic change, none of that. Um, I came to, when my father passed away, I, I came to Calgary and um, uh, in order to be closer to my grandchildren and uh, my son and his wife. And I, I wasn't here two weeks and I had people in the Lutheran community and beyond who told me in no uncertain terms, you can't talk about faith and creation in Alberta. Uh, well, I took that as a challenge. Um, the, the concern was there were too many people who were invested in fossil fuel industries, people who were um, on the one hand defensive because they had been uh, uh, criticized, judged for what they had done. On the other hand, they were, they were wanting to to uh, secure their, their family's well-being and, and provide for that appropriately. And there had to be another way. I, I began um, uh, searching through webinars and, and other relationships, ecumenically, interfaith, looking for community, which is an important value and, and a sustaining um, uh, requirement for if you're going to do social activism and, and climate care stuff. Um, I looked as much because I came from my kind of a tradition. Faith was quite intellectual. So I was reading, 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 which is great for me. I was writing uh, blogs, but they weren't being read. Um, it just was not, was not working for me. And I, was, I would approach congregations because my passion um, is not to go uh, petition city hall or, or work with the governments. My passion is to work with spiritual formation, um, to work with people in retreats and in Bible studies, looking for how God is calling them to be stewards, yes, to be neighbors, yes, to be um, kin to all of creation, not just human creation. So my story is a story about inspiration, imagination, enthusiasm, and a lot of obstacles like indifference and apathy and even outright resistance. So I needed to find community. I needed to find a soul. And I needed to find God in creation, part of creation, breathing with creation. And I, I'm finding it. Let me talk about three things that are working. Um, 
Elise mentioned them. Um, I agree with what you said, Abheva. People can't do their outer work. They can't go out and serve in the world if they haven't done their inner work. And I, I've, I was exploring why are people afraid to get out there? Why are people afraid to address um, climate and climate change? And why are people afraid? Oh, they're afraid. And they're hurting. They are mourning so much that they've lost. So this six-week program that we are um, uh, establishing and beginning in a couple of weeks, um, building on the work of Britt Ray, Jennifer Atkinson, uh, uh, Sarah Jacquette Ray, um, looking at, uh, as you mentioned, um, the effects of climate anxiety. And, and, and I'm arguing that the body of Christ, the living people of faith, um, embodying Christ, embodying um, faithfulness individually, embodying faithfulness as a community, embodying the same creative dust and spirit that is in all creation. We have resources to embrace these people and, and encourage healing and, and movement. So that's, that's the one thing. The other thing that is, is very fun is this idea of wilding the church, getting people outside the four walls, getting them uh, back into nature, to appreciate nature, to, to seek and to, to discover the divine in nature um, and their kinship with nature and kinship with others, regardless of faith expressions. This is um, not Lutheran. It's not Christian. It's it's ecumenical, it's interfaith, and, and it is attracting people who have given up on organized religion, but, but have not given up on nature. So this idea of, of getting out once a month with other people to, to embrace creation. Um, we did some experimenting in the, um, in the summer, and it's becoming a regular practice now into the fall. And thirdly, I have this this passion for sacred water, it was stimulated by some, by some uh, uh, webinars, but it's stimulated by my concern as a fisherman, as an environmentalist, as, as somebody who works at, uh, at Bow Habitat, as a volunteer, um, as somebody who just needs to bathe, brush my teeth, and drink the water. I'm concerned about the care of water, living water. So I'm, I'm developing now, um, uh, some conversations with people of a variety of faiths to have to have people come and describe out of their sacred writings, their traditions, their rituals, how is water um, uh, valued, um, how is it understood to be sacred, and then to have conversations with industrial people, in, um, um, political people, to talk about where does our water come from, um, what are the what are the challenges to water, the the impacts upon our water, how do we protect our water, and, and not to make that a, a confrontational kind of, of uh, event, but a, a process, and I hope it is a process of, of becoming a series of conversations um, where, we, where we work cooperatively and collaboratively on, uh, uh, on the care of our water and the care of one another. Um, there was a, a webinar just last week about our rivers coming into Calgary and beyond. We have water, of course, coming down out of the mountains and then going all the, into Montana and into Saskatchewan. But the flows are changing. Uh, the, the snowpack is changing. The, there is less reliability in the snow and more um, uh, complexity because of the rains, which are, are too much at one point and too little. And, and how do we live with that? Um, not manage it. How do we live with that? So these are wonderful times. I, I, I see that there is a spirit um, at work where I was talking about kind of wandering and lost and, and, and seeking community. I'm finding community through gatherings like this. Um, yeah, <laughs> Elise mentioned that I'm, um, I'm a certified animator with Laudato Si. I'm probably the only Lutheran they have. I don't know. Uh, I, I know I am the only Lutheran in Western Canada. But, but um, it, it's, it's amazing. If, if you're struggling with your own um, identity and, and source of energy, um, don't give up on community. Don't give up on the spirit. Don't give up 
on the possibility and the imagination of faith. I'll end there. Thank you, Dave. I think that's a beautiful way to close it up. Reminder that we need community. And also a great segue to the community of <laughs> our next speakers. Um, so uh, our next speakers are the Alouette sisters. Um, so the Alouette sisters are Catherine Hembling, Ruth Walmsley, and uh, Jeanette McIntosh. And they all live on the unceded traditional lands of the Musqueam, the Squamish, and the Tsleil also known as Vancouver, BC. Um, Ruth is a member of the Religious Society of Friends, also known as the Quakers. Um, Catherine is a member of the Unitarian Universalist community for the last 45 years and also a Buddhist practitioner for the last 20 years. Um, and her grandchildren, uh, her granddaughters, uh, the two of them are the ones that inspire her activism. Um, Jeanette was born and raised in Japan, actually, with roots in the Korean uh, Christian Church of Japan, and currently uh, is a member of the Presbyterian Church of Canada. She delights in intercultural and ecumenical interfaith justice work um, with Kairos Canadian Ecumenical uh, Justice Initiatives, um, doing uh, health and sustainability, community education, and volunteering. Um, this collective, this wonderful collection of women, um, on September 8th in 2021, uh, they were part of a prayerful and peaceful uh, act of civil disobedience. They sat in front of a workers gate blocking a big machine to protest the work of the Trans Mountain Pipeline expansion. Um, they are just three of 245 plus bold indigenous and settler land and water defenders that have been arrested since 2018 for acting uh, to stop the, the pipeline in an effort to prevent uh, catastrophic climate change. Um, so they, they, they uh, serve nine days together in uh, the Alouette Correctional Center for Women, and uh, they learned that they uh, can sing in three piece harmony. And so they're a wonderful group that we have on. Um, and they were set free the day before Catherine's 80th birthday. And so uh, I would like you to welcome um, uh, and listen to the stories of these three beautiful women. Thank you so much, Elise. Uh, it's so good to be with you. And as you say, the three of us have been very involved uh, in the effort to stop the, uh, what was the Kinder Morgan pipeline now called the Trans Mountain Pipeline, um, also known as TMX. And uh, for those who may not know, this project involves the construction of a new oil pipeline from the Alberta tar sands to a marine terminal in Burnaby, just four kilometers from where I live. And toxic diluted bitumen would there be loaded onto tankers and shipped to other destinations around the world where it would be refined and burned, increasing carbon emissions and endangering marine ecosystems uh, while en route through the oceans. Uh, so actually we were all arrested on different days. Uh, Jeanette was, as you say, on, on September 8th. I was arrested on September 9th and Catherine was arrested a couple weeks after that. Um, but all of us were uh, arrested in the context of an interfaith prayer circle, nonviolent direct action. So each of us entered an active Trans Mountain work zone in a, well, personally, I was, Catherine and I were arrested in the, in the forest, uh, close to where they were cutting trees uh, in preparation for pipeline construction. Uh, we got as far as we could, and when we were blocked by security, we just sat down and started singing and meditating and praying and singing songs to honor the sacredness of water uh, in order to make the statement that this desecration of Mother Earth must stop. Mm -hmm. All of us were charged with uh, criminal contempt of court for breaching an injunction issued by the court to Trans Mountain. And in the six months that followed, we appeared before the BC Supreme Court in Vancouver three times before receiving our 14 day sentence on February 14th, which was Valentine's Day. That was the day that we went into jail. Um, so I'll just talk a little bit about um, my experience as a Quaker in relation to doing this work. Um, at the core of my Quaker faith 
is a commitment to be faithful to what I perceive to be leadings of the spirit. Uh, Quakers have a practice of meeting most well, at least in Canada, there are different kinds of Quakers, but um, we meet together in silent worship. And I would ex say that what I experienced was uh, uh, a spiritual leading to engage in violent civil disobedience as an expression of my profound concern about the harm that's being caused to the earth especially by the expansion of new fossil fuel projects and the increased carbon emissions which come from that. And this felt like the most powerful action that I could take to express my, uh, to express my concern. I, I was involved in many other things over the last 10 years to express my concern, but it has gotten to the point where these projects are still going ahead and we felt like we really had no choice but to take this kind of um, very strong action. Um, I asked for and received what's called a clearness committee from my Quaker meeting, which helped me to confirm the rightness of moving forward to risk arrest. Community really is at the core of what sustains me in my climate activism. Um, in addition to the support I've received from my Quaker community in Canada and in Vancouver, an, an essential source of support has come from our multi-faith uh, affinity group. We have been brought together by this deep need for community to sustain us in doing this, in doing this difficult work. In 2018, I started the Earth Witness Worship Meeting, which was truly a multi-faith group, including Quakers, Buddhists, Unitarians, United, Anglican, Presbyterian, Catholic, and some people who were not affiliated with any faith group. We met every month for two and a half years, right next to the Indigenous Watch House, which is located on Burnaby Mountain, right next to the Trans Mountain Tank Farm Oil Storage Facility. And over the years of meeting together, we developed a really deep sense of community and mutual support. And all of us are united in a desire to connect our faith with our climate justice and Indigenous solidarity work. And about one and a half years ago in early 2021, when a group called Protect the Planet was maintaining a tree sit in Burnaby to protect trees from being cut in the path of the pipeline, the Earth Witness Worship Meeting transitioned into being the Prayer Circle Direct Action Group, which is dedicated to taking spiritually rooted nonviolent direct action. Then in March 2021, just um, about a year and a half ago, the Prayer Circle did our first uh, nonviolent direct action by blocking a vehicle gate at uh, a, a construction site near the tree sit. And we sat in meditation and prayer in front of the gate, uh, preventing equipment and vehicles from going through, um, which is how Jeanette was arrested. Um, this uh, was the beginning of, of a few different direct actions, which eventually led to the three of us and, and three others. Uh, we are known as the Brunette River Six. Um, we were all arrested in the fall of 2021. Um, for opposing the Trans Mountain uh, project. So yeah, I think we're each going to take about five minutes to kind of um, share some of that story for ourselves. So uh, I'll pass it on to one of you. Who's going to go next? You want to go next? Do your closing thoughts? I think maybe we'll do that later. Okay. First of all, I want to acknowledge the leadership of the Indigenous people, particularly the Tsleil-Waututh in this struggle against Trans Mountain Pipeline. I am very grateful for their legal cases, for sharing ceremonies with us, and for their arrests. And I'm very grateful for the, their courage and persistence. And thank you, Elise, for inviting us, and thank you for being present uh, via Zoom tonight. Um, as members of faith communities, I think we all share a commonality, that we are all encouraged to live our values, and so that's what I'm going to be talking to you about. 
And what are my values? Well, they are shaped, of course, by my family, and uh, but they are the values of the community of my Unitarian Church. We are a small progressive church with roots going back 500 years. Uh, the original Unitarians were heretics because they were not Trinitarians. They didn't believe in the Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost. But at this point in time, we've, uh, we evolve, and we ha do not have a Instead, we covenant with each other to affirm and promote eight principles. And in 1985, we added a, the seventh principle, which is we covenant to affirm and pr promote the interconnected web of all existence of which we are a part. And that is the principle which motivated me eventually to civil disobedience. I think we have slides that show Berard in that. The one before, uh, the one before yep. this one? One slide back here. Okay, my arrest uh, in September of 21, 2021 was a long time coming. Um, the one before. Yeah, the one before this. The one before this with the harbor. Showing lots of water. One, there, there we are. Okay, so this is a picture of Burrard Inland, taken actually from the commuter train looking towards the North Shore Mountains. Uh, in the foreground to the left, you can see the, the not uh, under construction, the TMX terminal. Across the water, you see the Slalwa Tooth Reserve and Kate's Park. And uh, in what? I was pausing to sit just in front of Kate's Park in my kayak when I was inspired. I was sitting with my paddle resting across the boat, listening, feeling the rise and fall of the water under me and around me, which was just lifting me quietly and gently. It was a familiar feeling of, of being rocked in the arms of a beloved. And it is a place that I sometimes rarely achieve in meditation. When I recognized that, I knew that I had to protect those waters. I had to line up with those who were already active in protecting the inlet from the destruction of inevitable oil spills, tank, fire, tank farm fires, and climate change and climate justice. That was when I started becoming active, attending National Energy Board hearings, writing letters, attending rallies, meeting with my MP, and I needed to find out more. But there was a growing rage in me at so many facts being willfully ignored, which did not improve my life. So in the fall of 2018, there was a massive march against TMX and the federal Liberal government, 10,000 strong by some estimates, organized and sponsored by the BC Association of Indian Chiefs. It was energizing, and I was there. After that, I began visiting the very peaceful encampment and sacred fire, and there I brought food, money, and mostly just listened to repre representatives of the elders. There were other demonstrations. Other people were arrested. I listened. I asked questions. I read reports. I made posters. I made acquaintances and then friends. And by the autumn of 2019, I was a member of the prayer circle beside the Slalbertooth Watch House that Ruth had established. In late December 2020, while I was still a member of the prayer circle, I began bringing food to the tree sitters, as well as acting as an observer, photographing TMX progress along the Brunette River between New Westminster and Burnaby. Then COVID came along. But I had a weekly date with vigorous exercise, a beautiful wild green space, friends, and I met amazing people of all ages. 
I had a sense of purpose and meaning. The next step was the decision to take nonviolent action and be arrested. And that came out of meditation early spring of 2021 when I, and I joined the prayer circle team. Ruth, Jeanette, Christine, all essential allies and sisters. I could never have done what we did without, without these support. I could not have been an activist also without being part of a community other than just the, those of us who were getting arrested. <laughs> so Protect the Planet was a community for me and the environment team of my own Unitarian Church were enormously supportive all the way through my activism. Ending up with, with food for the tree sit, at prayer circles, for potential arrests, court appearances, and giving me a terrific 80th birthday party. So I'm blessed to be part of the Alouettes. Harmony is magic. It opens up and encourages others. Singing provides us with an entry to speak to others about hope and agency in dark times. And I take inspiration now from a quote. Chris Homer Dixon's book called Commanding Hope, The Power We Have to Renew a World in Peril. And he says, we have to find a kind of hope that has muscular character and a sense of urgence, of agency. If you're interested, you can find a summary of his July 13th talk on CBC. And I, develop, I believe that we all develop hope by living our values in good company, being curious and open, fact-checking, and taking small steps. Looking for small spaces where we can say, I could do that. And so I encourage you to develop hope. Thank you, Catherine. Next slide, please. So imagine a place, a life-giving and life-sustaining place, and it's being threatened. Whatever your creed and your spiritual practice, Imagine the special people who center their hearts and minds with you and your surroundings for healing and protection. And imagine the sense of awe and wonder, of gratitude, in communion, in community, faith in practice, being a witness together. And to your right are the four of us that Catherine named, including our friend Christine. Remember our small beginnings, the original intentions and our purpose. Like Catherine says, no small act is insignificant. It all adds up with hope, with prayer and meditation and singing too, in collective wisdom, the source, our nourishment, our well. And the ability to call upon friends for prayers and guidance, like Ruth referenced, her group within the Quakers, for me, a group of Presbyterian prayerful supporters who listened and discerned with me each step of the way. To me, my faith is in prayerful action. It's connecting heart and mind, guided by the Spirit. This brings a sense of wholeness, an interconnectedness we seek and need for our well being and all of life's flourishing. Yes, community. Yes with love and in peaceful ways and as witness. But we've been witnessing the destruction of water sources and unseeded and unsurrendered indigenous lands long enough and know the science of climate change. There is no excuse not to act. And locally, the Brunette River was being threatened. A precious life-giving habitat for salmon, otters, turtles, great blue herons and nooksack dace a species at risk, and where tree sitters were also determined to protect. We felt the urgency to act. The discovery and witnessing of the tree cutting with the hummingbird nest in the spring was a timely gift, and it halted Trans Mountain's work there for three months. But the heat dome and the resulting fires, deaths, displacements, 
and the United Nations Secretary General describing UN Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change report of August 2021 as code red for humanity, and seeing the workers return right after Labor Day weekend in full force, as if there was no end and all is well, were all contributing factors for me to take action. My motivation was driven by faith, hope, compassion, and love. My prayers, hopes, and actions had only one goal in mind that day, for all life to flourish. As it was in the beginning, as God intended and called good and very good. God's creation, God's weaving, is part of our weaving too, in partnership with God. And I thank that language for Dr. late Dr. Sally McFaig, who gave me the eco-theological language to what I was accustomed to within the sustainability field that I was working in, in a secular university. Next slide, please. So our prayerful actions went on to public speaking, to public engagement and widening the circle. There's Catherine sitting right at that gate at our first action in March of 2021. Yes, we grieve this loss, but yes, with love and compassion too for the next generation and the next generation and next generations to come with hope. And within our interfaith partnerships through Green Faith and taking political action and going to Jonathan Wilkinson's office to deliver 10 demands. Next slide, please. So we keep going. That's what we do. As Abe, say, Abe said, uh, char, Chardikala, <laughs> yep, that's the spirit. I really feel it too. We can't give up. And as Desmond Tutu, uh, Desmond Tutu had said and really sparked for me, uh, continuing inspiring is if you're neutral in situations of injustice, you have chosen the side of the oppressor. I stand on the side to seek justice. I hope you do too. Thank you. Thank you, sister. Thank you, all the white sisters. Bring us back to hope. I think that's a beautiful roundabout way. Hope, hope has been the stream that's gone through all of our conversations. And it's that community and the 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 connection um internal work external work action um all these things for you thank you to all our speakers um and now it's a chance for us to listen to uh the Alouette sisters sing and while they do i want you to think about uh, and reflect on what you've heard tonight what resonated with you and what questions are coming up um, so as they sing, please feel free to add your questions for the Q&A, which is coming up next, uh, into the chat and um, uh, Beatrice will collect them. So I will pass it back to uh, the Alouette sisters to lead us in a song. Thank you. When I 
go down, down to the water by the water I feel cold. So, um, I, right now, um, I'm opening it up. Uh, so if folks are interested in um, sharing their questions, they can put up their hand. Um, the, I'm like, this hand, is it this one? No, uh, maybe this one. If you indicate in some capacity that you would like to speak, um, and if not, um, Beatrice, do we have uh, questions in the chat? Yes, we have a question from Charlie, and the question for all of the wonderful speakers, this is Charlie speaking, um, inspired by what Abe said, about eternal optimism. How do you stay strong when you experience ecological grief and anxiety? Um, and I suppose Abby can answer first because you said the, the uh, eternal optimism. So. Yeah, for sure. Um, I appreciate that question and I appreciate all the comments from everyone else so far. This has been wonderful to listen to. Uh, I think, you know, to, to add to the question, actually, for me, it is and, and for a lot of young people that I've talked to and interviewed and worked with at Break the Divide as well, it, it's more than just grief and anxiety. People talk about intense feelings of hypocrisy, feelings of guilt, of contributing to a system, yet living within it, yet arguing for change, uh, complex feelings of uh, not recognizing what to do with a privilege, so uh, feelings of apathy. But I, I think what also comes with those emotions is hope and excitement and feeling connected. I think for myself, action is a very good way to like feel connected and feel like I'm doing something, uh, listening and learning from other people. I also don't um, want to discount at all the importance of sort of learning about these issues from a sort of more medical or clinical perspective. I think it's so important to understand what eco-anxiety is, how it manifests in yourself. I remember in 2020 when BC had really bad wildfires like and smoke was everywhere in Metro Vancouver. I was home, and this was a COVID year. I remember it was my first day of my second year of university starting and I was on my computer online because of COVID. And I wanted to go outside for a run, but I couldn't because of the smoke. And I remember just not going out even when the smoke did go away. And I realized in retrospect that for me, that was, that was how that eco-anxiety, that eco-despair manifested in myself. So I think learning about what climate emotions look like in you, uh, being connected with resources that can support you in that, and then engaging in that action is um, something that's been very powerful for me and I think can be for other people too. Um, does uh, Dave have any comments on that or any of the sisters? Sure, um, thank you. <clears throat> I, I underscore the importance of hope. I think that hope is something we discover. I'm not sure that hope is something that we generate. For me, it's more of a gift that is given to our suffering, to our sense of loss, um, to our sense of um, a changing identity. So I guess if I'm experiencing anxiety, guilt, hypocrisy, a sense of privilege, my first thing is stay with it. Um, listen to it. What is this telling me? And you can only do that in a state of grace. Um, the sense that I, I need to look at this and then I need to receive from community, from the divine, from nature from the water from the air from there are practices that we do of course there are <clears throat> but you don't fix it um i think you you go through it and find that something is drawing you through it and will lead you to life god fundamentally creation fundamentally is life seeking life and so in that confidence I can get up in the morning and feel the pain knowing that it's, I almost said it's going to go away. It may not. This grief is different from losing a spouse or a child because 
the environmental crisis is getting deeper and longer. So we experience grief, we come through it, we don't experience the sorrow every day. We, there are moments of singing and dancing. <clears throat> and then when it comes back, then I have a different perspective that says, all right, there are resources that will get us through this. So I just add that part. Thank you. And um, does, do any of the Alouette sisters have a comment on the question, which I can repeat, um, how do you stay strong when you experience ecological grief and anxiety? So one of the, one of the things, it's a little bit of a, a saying that we have in our Protect the Planet group uh, is uh, action is the antidote to despair, despair, as other people have kind of alluded to that as well, the importance of action and especially action, which is taken in the context of, of community, um, of like an affinity group, whether it's your faith group or, or um, some other group. Um, that I think um, has been true for me and I think for, for a lot of the people in our group. Um, and also I think knowing what your limits are in terms of uh, um, tuning into media sources and, and hearing about, you know, the, the mainstream media is just absolutely full of, of uh, uh, disastrous news like every day. <laughs> And I think one thing I've learned is that to be mindful of how much I kind of expose myself to that, there are times when it's it's wise in terms of self-care to just um, um, take care with that and maybe take a break from, from being really exposed to that uh, uh, never-ending barrage of bad news. Mm -hmm. Do you want to say anything? Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Um, I think the, the usual things for maintaining good mental health are really, really important. So I find I need to be doing as much exercise as I can manage. I also love music and dancing. I love being regularly as I can. I go hiking. All of those nourish me. But I think it's also, uh, maybe as Ruth is suggesting, it's also important for activists to take time and step back completely because you can deplete yourself. And uh, so it's important to step back and then re-engage. And one of the great things about being part of many communities is that there are small successes here and there, which are enormously cheering. I'm thinking just right right now that although here in, in the TMX, we feel as if we are fleas on the back of an elephant, uh, nevertheless, we, when we rejoice in hearing about the Klebona keepers, who are indigenous elders from Iskut, who have managed to hold off mining companies now for 15 years. So we, we find encouragement with other people's successes. And the hummingbird. Oh, and the hummingbird. Yeah. 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 The, the story of the hummingbird. Yes. Um, just, just quickly, um, I see hope as being active also. So we're a part of it. And yes, we take rest. Sleep for me is very important that impacts me greatly. Um, so in addition to all the other things for self-care, it's part of it. But Joanna Macy is the one who turned me to that word, active hope. And um, yeah, you might wanna check out some of her writings as well, because she's been at, in this work for a long time. Thank you. Um, I'm looking for more questions, there is, uh... People, well, someone Agnes writes that she's inspired by several of the quotes, not really a question, but just um, maybe things that resonated with her, find and cultivate hope in the agency in dark times, um, finding ways of wild in the church, and I like intentionally moving through apathy, empathy and towards action. So that was from Agnes. 
I have a question, um, and that's like, my question is why are there so few of us risking a risk um, doing civil disobedience? I think that in Canada, maybe, maybe, maybe I'm, maybe I'm not, you know, being sensitive to to those who, but I I just wonder, like, you know, if, if I know there was, um, I think it was uh, Dr. King who said that, you know, um, in times of trouble, jail should be fear filled, or somebody said that that quote. But so, is it is it worth what's stopping most many people, in your opinion? Like you know, you you you've risked arrest, you've been arrested, you've been sat in jail. Is it that bad? Is it? What do you what, what do you think? Well, maybe some words of encouragement for those who maybe are scared or something. You know? No, in in Canada in mm -hmm. the Alouette Women's Prison. It is not that bad. Um, it is difficult. The system is designed to diminish you. And so there's a lack of outdoor space to exercise, to see the sky, uh, to even have daylight in, and you're under lights artificial lights the whole time. But I think it, going back to the to the beginning of your question, why are there so few? I think I come to the conclusion that being arrested is not necessarily the best thing to do. Because in Canada, we have a system of injunctions, which is absolutely rigid, that the power that uh, companies and going back through the history of injunctions, it was the power of the aristocracy um, to maintain the, the law in their favor is still there. And getting in arrested, it doesn't get you much publicity. Um, I don't think it's the most important thing to do. I think the most important thing to do is probably and to support them. Sorry, I didn't have the last part. The most important thing to do is join other organizations and see mm -hmm. where you fit in, what you can do in that organization. And of course, political action is one of those organizations too. But I'm a pretty practical person. <laughs> I leave it to others to theorize. You, you ask about why so few in this vast big country of ours and I remember flying across it the, at a young age back from Japan and just being utterly shocked at how big this country is and how much forest how green how lush and the big stretch of the Saskatchewan prairies to more forest more water like the resources are abundant and I wonder sometimes if that puts us in a state of oblivion where we think, ah, we've got it all. What are we talking about? And people sort of get this sense of, well, we're not threatened yeah. until these most recent two or three years where it's gotten a little closer mm -hmm. for comfort. And maybe that will, that will spark change. Um, you know, you, you made reference a day for Northern climate. I was woken up by Sheila Wakluchie's speech and her right to be cold, the book that she yeah. had published. Yeah. And, you know, yes, North and South, we struggle and we've been in between, but we also know that it's not just six degree of separation. I think it's closer to two or three degrees of separation in terms of how many of our family or loved ones are tied to the fossil fuel industry. And that mm -hmm. makes it difficult too. Yeah. And so how, how do we address it from a family and a perspective within our faith communities uh, that challenge the models that mm -hmm. we know aren't working anymore that need to change. And that means we need to raise our voices and, and yeah. start having these conversations, which I'm grateful to be a part of. So thank you very much for inviting us. Thank you. 
Uh, I recognize that we are running low on time. And so uh, I wanted to invite anyone who hasn't um, kind of shared um, closing thoughts or um, hopes or ways that people can continue the work that's being done uh, or support the work that's being done. Um, so maybe uh, um, Alouette Sisters, uh, do you have uh, any closing thoughts? Uh, I could just say, one of the things that has um, helped me in terms of dealing with uh, anxiety and being overwhelmed um, and keeping on is just to remember that I'm really not responsible for carrying the world on my shoulders or for, for solving all of these problems by myself. Uh, that I am really only responsible for living up to the light that is granted to me uh, to doing that which I am actually called to do, and that's enough. I'm not responsible for solving it, um, but I am responsible for listening and being true to doing what it is that I'm called to do. So that's just encouragement for everyone to really listen to what is it that you are called to do and find people to do it with and um, that's all that's really all you need to do if i could add to that yeah i don't know why i need to it was so well said um but just to expand that <clears throat> this isn't on my terms it isn't my way it isn't my time i'm not in charge of this but there's always something i can do because I'm put here for a reason. There's something that I can receive, which um, calls something forth from you to give. And there's something I can give back. Um, it takes imagination, it takes trust, it takes honesty, and it takes humility. Dave, Abe, final thoughts? Final thoughts, yeah. No, this, again, this has been a wonderful discussion. I think, you know, what I'm, what I'm left really thinking of is, as all of us have discussed, what is the scope of influence that you have and where can you make that change? And what knowledge systems can you draw from to drive that change? Like, how can we be you know, intersectional or, or, or really at a simple term, how can we understand the different issues that are connected in our work? Understanding that the issues of climate change are not disconnected from issues of biodiversity, are not disconnected to issues of race, of colonialism in this country. Like I think especially within sort of religious and spiritual communities, recognizing that the connection between religion and issues of race, of colonialism, like that is deep introspection that each of us can do within the areas where we have influence uh, and changing the mindsets and imagining new ways of being, of existing in this world moving forward, like that is huge. And, and so if we, can, if, we, if we can create these cross-cultural, cross-communal, um, intergenerational coalitions to take this action, uh, that is powerful. And, and I think each one of us here has the immense capability to do that. Thank you. Yes, each one of us here is all a part of, 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 of and connected to each other. Um, and the FCG, G, the Faith in the Common Good Network is part of that. That's the idea is that we have these conversations, we create space to meet each other and to build relationship and take things to the next step. Um, Beatrice, do you want to send the next slide? Um, you can find, um, more of the, if you, if you have not actually attended the earlier sessions, these conversations were rich and um, fruitful. Um, and you can 
listen in um, and, and hear the voices from other places and other people and other communities. Um, we also have on our website, many resources. If you're interested in getting deep, more involved, um, we've got resources for uh, greening your own community, for um, building chapters of different cities, um, uh, making connections uh, with uh, folks in different places across the country. Um, we're connected into Green Faith International, for example. Um, and uh, there's ways for you to get involved and find community and find connection of people who are doing similar things. And so next slide. Um, uh, so these are some of the resources you can find there. You can connect with us on um, social media. We, uh, we send out updates about um, uh, events that are going on across the country, ways that people can get involved. Um, and uh, we like to share what you're doing in your own community. And so if you're doing something, um, we love to let people know and spread the word about the good things that have been going on. Um, next slide. Um, for those of you who are in Calgary right now, actually, there is an upcoming event that's going to be um, coming up, and it is connected to Kairos, who uh, Janet was talking about. So the Prairies North region is having their annual community or uh, annual gathering in the fall. Um, that's going to be October 29th, and we're going to be there. I'm going to be there specifically. So if you want to see me and say hi, uh, come check it out. Um, there is going to be an online component. So if you are in Saskatchewan, Alberta, uh, Northwest Territories, anywhere, really, if you're anywhere, you can watch it. But um, it's gonna be on Saturday the 29th. And uh, yeah, there's more information on the, on the FCG website. Um, next slide. What is the next slide? Oh, the thank you slide. Um, yes, big thank you to all of our speakers today. Um, I feel like, yes, there's so much richness um, and insights that, that will continue to be absorbed. Um, we will send this video out um, when we get it online so that you can watch it again if you really want to. Um, to everyone in the, in the room, thank you so much for coming. Uh, thank you, Beatrice, for doing an amazing job of, of uh, juggling some things. So big claps to you. And uh, yes, if you want more information about what we do, or if you want to connect with us, let, uh, shoot us an email. Um, you can find all the information on the website. And so thank you so much for everyone for coming. And uh, we'll let you go now. But have a great night. Um, stay in touch. And uh, we'll see you at the next climate narratives. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you for a great evening. Beautiful. Great speakers. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Send them off. Mm. Want us to sing you out? <laughs> As we go. Mm.